You're busy. You've got a decent practice, but nobody wants to be decent. You want to be great, and you want to have a great practice. So how did the most productive, profitable dentist in the nation balance real life, work, and profits, and somehow make it all seem fun? Well, it comes down to simple, everyday practices. So grab a lunch, join us as we chat with top clinicians and influencers to discover their formula for uncommon success. Are you ready? Then it's time to explore everyday practices. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Everyday Practices. No, this is not a joke. We have a national pandemic going, but to make it happier, we are having a special podcast today called Everyday Practices Uncensored with Dr. Howard Ferran. Dr. Howard Ferran, how are you doing today? I'm doing so good. How are you doing? I'm doing okay. I, you know what? Better than two weeks ago. I just feel like uh, more and more, you know, we get perspective and, and it's, we're, we're moving on. And uh, I've, I've been on almost every day phone calls. It's probably every other day phone calls with Regan Robertson, my co-host here. Regan, how are you doing? Doing pretty good today. Fangirling out on our guest, of course. Yes, I know. This is really cool. So I'm kind of curious, uh, Dr. Howard Fran, I've never got to uh, talk with you in person before, but you do kind of um, seem like uh, you're a, I don't know how to word, um, you're you're quite an independent thinker and you're a contrarian in a lot of times, but um, what's your take on this uh, this COVID issue and how are we handling it? What are some of the things that we could be doing better? What are some of the things that we're doing right? All that kind of stuff. Well, um, thanks for having me come on your show. It's an honor to be on your show. Um, the, the bottom line is um, all throughout history, it's about controlling the conversation. I mean, um, you know, you, you, you go back to the uh, most ancient Chinese um, wars, they'd say, don't shoot the messenger because the, the warring warriors needed to be able to talk. So it took a long time to just get the evolution of advancement of saying, okay, I'm going to send a messenger out to tell Reagan at the battlefield what my, my terms are. Maybe, maybe I want to, um, um, maybe I want to uh, not fight, but you, you had to agree that if you didn't like the message, you can't kill the messenger. Mm -hmm. And you see this in, in Greek writings and you see it in literature and you see it in, um, um, all over, but, um, you know, usually, um, you know, I, I saw this growing up at home. I, I grew up in an extremely Catholic family. My two older sisters became nuns. And if you even asked about the merits of, say, say birth control, um, it, it, was, it was offensive. And they were offended that you would even ask. Just to even talk about it. And right now, um, with this pandemic, um, you clearly see that if you even question um, anything. Um, you're crazy, a traitor, but um, I, I believe that um, for number one, it's a brand new novel virus. I mean, they, they're even saying that. It's the uh, SARS-2. It's severe acute respiratory syndrome. It's the second one. Seven coronaviruses since 1960 have been found to enter humans, but they don't know anything about this virus. And you have to, um, you know, but you, you give the, the media... Uh, um, you know, a little bit of information and then they, they run with it. But I've noticed that on Dentaltown, since Dentaltown, everyone's a doctor. I mean, they have all got eight years of college. They all took epidemiology, physics, chemistry, biology. Sure. <clears throat> and I find it very interesting that when dentists just question the model, it goes right into um, bullying and you can't, you know, That's right. say that and all this. Kind of, but, but, but so what I'm going to say is that we're obviously at this time in humanity of 2020, probably 90% of all knowledge is above our comprehension. Um, but the epidemiologists say that we're dealing with a lot of imperfect information and we're making a lot of big decisions based on very imperfect um, information. So when I'm talking to my individual homie, I mean, it just is what it is. So we don't, we don't have time to discuss everything that's right or wrong with, government and science. Well, here's a good point. Here's a good point is, you know, a lot of times we talk about evidence-based medicine and evidence-based dentistry, but that's kind of out the window right now, because if we said that this is kind of almost a, a dig at evidence-based medicine and dentistry, because uh, to some degree we say, well, you know, like, unless we see a double blind, uh, you know, 20 year study with 40,000 people in it. I'm not going to believe it, but it's just like, well, we don't have time for that. So we almost have to hit, you know, boots on the ground with our, with our, uh, and then pragmatically adjust as we're going. And 
um, the New York Times printed out last year, there's no evidence on flossing. I mean, how would you have a double blind study on flossing? You have two identical twins. Yeah, we're totally hosed. Turn off to your grandmother and tell her not to floss. And the other Something one- that I, I want to know regarding that is whether the virus can enter orally through the ulcerative spots subgingivally through periodontal disease. And if a majority of, of elderly people have periodontal disease, what happens for the viral entry point not being just your lungs, but also if pneumonia for hospital-based people is from the mouth, why wouldn't it also be able to pass through the ulcerative spots uh, known as periodontitis? Uh, it's a rhetorical question. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think, you know, if, um, if Streptococcus mutans was a size of a football stadium, I mean, the, the whole arena, you know, they think of an enclosed um, um, football arena a virus would be the size of a ping pong ball and they don't know a lot about them, but they do know that there's about a hundred of them um, that um, we pass around like this, like, like colds and flus and this. Yes. So when you start, um, so when you, so when a virologist makes a test and a test for Corona, well, he doesn't have a test for all 100 viruses. They only really, really test maybe 10. So, so but it makes people every, feel better. But everybody that's sick and dying in a hospital, so you could be in a hospital in Italy dying of influenza and pneumonia and test positive for COVID-19, and it's still a COVID-19 um, statistic. Mm-hmm. So um, a lot of epidemiologists are saying that, you know, you're not going to know till this whole thing is over. But when it's over, they think there's obviously going to be a greater mortality rate, but, but some of them are thinking it, it might be 20% over how many die. I mean, two years ago, the United States had 80,000 people die of influenza, the flu, and it didn't even make the news. I mean, nobody heard about it. And now, um, you know, with this one, it's, um, it's shut down the entire U.S. economy. Uh, we're probably going to have a contraction of the GDP, you know, 15 to 30 percent. There could be 30 to 40 million unemployed people. So that's where we're at right now. That, that's the momentum going forward that we have to deal with. All right. So so here's my question. I mean, if you get to do uncensored all the time, then I get to do a little uncensored on you. And for, I mean, I don't normally hear you getting interviewed. So uh, this, this is almost fun that because I've, I've watched enough and I want to say thank you to your crew for putting it on YouTube because that's actually my favorite way to, um, to watch, which it doesn't look like there's a lot of hits on the YouTube, but I, I want to give positive feedback. I am one of the few that do watch it on YouTube and um, and a majority of YouTube watchers, they say 80% of YouTube is watched by men. And so I want you to know, <clears throat> because dentistry, at least, you know, like historically has been, uh, uh, well, m- men dominated and whatnot. But like, here I am a guy watching YouTube and watching uh, dentistry uh, uncensored. And, and I'm thankful for that. So thank you. Um, but I, I want to ask you a hot seat question. And you don't have to necessarily answer that you're card, uh, card carrying. But are you leaning more towards libertarianism? Uh, it seems as though th- that when you talk, that's what I've picked up, is that you kind of push more towards the libertarian uh, mentality, whether it be uh, scientifically, dentistry related or whatnot. And yet still at the same time, we have to figure out as a community and as a nation, as an international body, you know, like, so do we play along with the government telling us, you know, what to do? And what do you say to the people who aren't complying it might be a big question, but what I'm asking is, it seems like you a lot of times lean towards the libertarian-esque model of, of how you um, interpret uh, being an independent thinker and whatnot. And then how does that in, um, play out into um, how you interpret the COVID uh, quarantines and everything like that? And as far as dentistry even being shut down, big question, sorry. No, that, that, that's a great question. So I, I would say, yes, I've, I've always been a libertarian. I've always been a registered libertarian. I knew it. But, I but, knew it. But I, I'm, I'm suspicious of labels because um, like, like, um, the, the way I see it is, okay, so we only have 5,000 years of recorded history, right? I mean, we know, we know from anthropology that Homo sapiens has been around 50,000 years about 110 billion of them have already lived and died. There's about 8 billion alive now. So, so 92% of all the people at the human party are, are dead in the graveyards. Yes. And for all the literature, um, um, you know, the, the, all the literature, the game's been played at the top. And by the top, I mean, we're one species. Now, when you say one species, 
then people start saying, you know, is that communism, socialism, one world government? Well, dude, you're, you're one species. You came from a mom and dad. And if you didn't have a mom and dad and you're the only person in Iowa, you're, you're a goner, you know? So, right. so we have the interest of the species and we have the interest of the individual. And I think the first 5,000 years, the first thing that pops up is the pyramids. Um, you know, that was a religious, you know, um, monument, um, so religion pops up first and then you see business pop up next. Then you see, when you say government, I don't like the term government because there's no evidence for government. I mean, every country starts with a military and ends with the military. And when they control a, a territory, when they force you to do something, it's the police. And when they do it on the next door neighbor, you call it a, a military or an army or a soldier, but it, it's basically the police and then, yeah. and then later academia. And so the first 5,000 years, the game was always played out at the top of how religion um, came down and influenced individuals, same, sure. with business, same with government, which I, I, I call government policia. I mean, that, that, that's all it is. Yeah, the police state. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, then you, um, and then academia. But I think that the entire world um, changed um, when they plugged the internet into the cell yes. in 2007. And for the, you know, Neil Armstrong landed on the moon in 1969. And now I have a stronger computer than Neil Armstrong. And all of NASA at that point. Yeah. And I, I was born in 62. And um, my right encyclopedias were, uh, were bought when I was 10. So that had been 72. And the encyclopedias my mom got at a garage sale were printed in 52. And now this kid's got 75 million pages of Wikipedia updated daily. Yes. So I see the big equilibrium. So I see a reset in the equilibrium between the species converging down and controlling the individual. Now the individual has the, the same playing card. And I think it's going to reset the equilibrium. So I think... So I've always been an individual person, sure. and just because I was born here, it affected that I speak English, I was born a Catholic, uh, my parents were Republicans, I was in Kansas, but that was just the randomness of where I was born. Yeah. Now I think the individual, I, I, I think when the um, smartphone came out in 2007 to 2107 will be human's greatest century uh, because you have this natural intelligence in your brain, the only intelligence we've ever observed anywhere. And, you know, the first 5,000 years, it was our big leg muscles doing all the work. And then we started inventing tools and our arm muscles started making tools. And now it's just our little bitty opposing thumb and on, next. on this artificial augmented, um, this augmented intelligence. Yeah. So I got my ophthalmic eyes looking at all information and my little opposing thumb jumping all around the world. And I think it's, it's, this is the error of the individual. So the individual is, um, was just launched in 2007. So I've seen every business from 2007 to 2020, the last 13 years since sent that out. Everyone that's focused on the individual has been scaling with geometric growth. But a lot of people think with their brakes on like you you say to any idea and they'll say well is that legal well is that you know is that okay i mean can you do that well so so they're all so worried about will this offend the 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 one trillion dollars uh, the united states economy is 19 trillion a year and and one trillion of that is from the one million attorneys and they're so worried about the legal community and the legal community is kind of the um, negotiator between the military, which is the government, and the business, and the and the religious, and and um, so I just don't even think of any of those aspects because those guys they got to play for five thousand years. So what I've always been is like, I, there's plenty of there'll always be religion and business and government and academia, and they'll always have the airtime and they're at the top game and all that stuff. Uh, but down here at the individual, um, you know, I. I'm only focused when, when I'm thinking and talking, I'm talking to one dentist and I don't know if he's in Kansas or Kathmandu. I don't know if he lives in a canoe, uh, but I only talk to the individual. And when I'm talking to an individual, I'm trying to help that individual negotiate on behalf of themselves. I'm not worried about 
you know, all the big institutions that have controlled the game for 5,000 years. Sure. So, so Howard, in that, it, taking it down to the individual, because, I mean, having this, this phone, what I've seen is you do have, you have information at your fingertips. It's difficult to weed out what's true from what's not true. And I think pulling it back to center, um, you said before we started recording, you're getting, you know, 300 emails. I'm sure that that's probably per hour as opposed to per day. I can't keep up with my emails right now. What advice are you giving doctors or guidance are you giving doctors as to how they can focus in and help themselves during this time? Yeah, this is, this is an unprecedented challenge um, time. So the first thing I started telling them is that, you know, during an economic contraction, um, I mean, during an economic expansion, which I, I've lived through five expansions, and this is my fifth contraction. So what goes up, you know, does come down. So during an expansion, um, debt is a tool. It's leverage. It's other people's money. And dentists know that. Like, I could have got a job at McDonald's for $10 an hour for 10 years and saved up my money to go to dental school. But instead I borrowed other people's money so I could go to dental school now and then pay it back while I make $100 an hour. So the use of student loans is why um, I was a dentist at 24 years old. So we all know that debt leverage is good going up, but when, you, but when it starts to contract, it is exactly the same physics in reverse and so the first thing I start doing is on behalf of the individual, I start telling them cash is king, you know, stop paying your rent. How long would it take for the landlord to kick you out? Stop paying all your bills um, because, you know, uh, of course they want you to give them all their money as they're contracting. And um, I think, um, so I'm telling them that, you know, focus on yourself. Don't pay your rent, mortgage, equipment, build out computer, insurance, mouth. Don't pay all that stuff until you know where you're at. And a lot of dentists, um, you know, they, they need to conserve cash. They need to serve, conserve cash flow. And, um, you know. Very cool. Yeah. Regan, does that, does that, I'm, I just wanted to make sure that that got to what, where you wanted with that question before I. <laughs> yeah, I think you get, yeah, I think it, you gave, you're giving doctors sort of an immediate ceasefire, what they can do in the interim. I think there's. Good there's, term much coming out with the CARES Act. I'm getting, I'm getting information overload. Are you getting information overload with how many webinars and um, live things coming at me and the legislation coming? It's just a lot to try to sift through and make sense. Yeah. And imagine in your situation where you're in a, I mean, you're in a good size organization. Imagine if you were doing that and you had one receptionist, one hygienist, one assistant, I mean, I'm lucky. I, the, you know, I, I, you know how many people work for me? No. About half. And um, <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, so I, I got a, I got a team of people that can put this together, and that's why you know I, um, we, we launched Dental Town in 1999. I, I had that up five years before Mark Zuckerberg did with Facebook, just, yeah. right? just for the for the individual. And so I really loved um, the individual, but. And the reason Dental Town is still um, has still thrived and grown a thousand new dentists a month ever since Zuckerberg launched a Facebook is because of the different forms who were at index form. Yes. So I can go in there and search SBA loan and pull up it all. So Whereas helpful. I don't follow you on Twitter, which I do chat. I follow you on Twitter. Um, you know, if 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 I remember a year from now some great post, well, what am I supposed to do? Go to Chad's. Twitter handle and start back scrolling. So I love the uh, message board indexing of the information. Um, the, every dentist I know is on probably about three different social media platforms. You know, there. Um, um, I noticed that the the business of dentistry is on LinkedIn. Um, I noticed when Trump uh, become the president of the United States on Twitter. Twitter. Um, for all the uh, business people and leaders in dentistry, Twitter um, exploded. And uh, Facebook is um, um, all kinds of things, but Dentaltown is an index form. So, so uh, it, it's been great that they have a great place to go. And, you know, like they'll ask me a question and I can go drop that question into the Dentaltown search bar and find the exact thread and send them the link. So it's, so it's almost like your FAQs. Yeah, um, talk to us about Dentaltown. What's... What's going on new with Dentaltown lately, and how are you guys adapting to all of this? I know you've got your massive message board, which I, uh, I'm a lurker, so I lurk around that on occasion. How's the, what's the temperature of everybody over there? And I'm crazy because I occasionally post and then just get slaughtered. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, well, 
you know what's neat about that is, you know, again, I, I have so many Catholic references because I actually, you know, sure, mother, it's your life. Yeah. Mother, she told me, she goes, Howie, you're so smart. I, you, when you grow up, you'll be the first American Pope. And I'm just like, I, you know, and, and that's, that I, that was my goal until I met this girl named Jane. And, uh, and then those plans that went out the window quick. Uh, was but, that really your goal? Did you go to seminary? Oh, my mom flew me to seminaries in uh, Lisbon, Portugal, and Iowa, and all over. My whole childhood, I was groomed to be this first American pope. And it worked for my oldest two sisters. They left high school and went straight to the nunnery. And I was on that plan, except for this girl named Jane. And I don't know what the hell she was thinking. Uh, but anyway, and, uh, so she threw all my plans out the window. But, but the bottom line is, back to the church, they had a devil's advocate. So let's say that I was nominated Reagan Robertson to be a saint. Well, they had an intellectual process of the devil's advocate. So there would be a team that their job, regardless of anything, they had to passionately sell that, no, in fact, Reagan should not be a saint and, and present evidence why. And humans don't like this intellectual exercise. Um, like they, the first thing they start doing is questioning motives. Like someone will say something. Like, like I saw uh, an econ- like anytime an economist <laughs> says, you know, are you sure? Are you sure? Hang on a second. Uh, anyway, um, says, you know, well, you know, are you sure we're going to hurt the economy? The first thing I say is, oh, well, you're a Wall Street guy. You're a finance guy. Well, it's a lot easier to just question your motives and dismiss you out of hand than it sure. is to really think. And of of course, labels. And do the work. And, um, you know, um, George Washington said that, um, you know, liberty was the most important. And the minute you take away the liberty, you can lead sheep to the slaughter. Well, and so I, it is. I've always, um, um, I've always loved the intellectual process. And I firmly believe that if you really think I should buy the blue ball, well, if you can't just as passionately explain why I should buy the red ball, then you don't even know your own arguments. You know what I mean? So I think it's balanced thinking. Um, you know, the, the only reason we know there's hot is because we know there's cold. We know, we know there's up because there's down. We know there's on, off. So if you really think we should all do this, then I want to hear you passionately sell me of why we should do the inverse. I mean, we start with addition. One plus one equals two followed by the inversion of subtraction, two minus one is back to one. We have multiplication, you know. That checks your work. Four, followed by the inversion, come back, division, four divided by two is back to two. Yep. So, so, when, so you can easily catch people's um, thinking errors when they start um, questioning your motives, when they can't passionately argue the exact opposite of what they're saying, and you see, um, and I, you see that in religion, politics, even academia. I mean, um, um, you know, so um, global warming, all, all these arguments. It's like if you just if you just ask a question about global warming, they try to shame you. Oh, well, you're just a fat baldy. You don't, you know, you're an, you're an old dentist. I mean, I mean, you know, it's like. Yep. Can you that just, went personal you, real fast. You, well, well, that's what they. But it that, goes there. Humans are very yeah. good at. They're very good at shaming. They're very good at bullying because they Ad know. Ad hominem attack. Bullying. Sure. So if I if I make you feel really uncomfortable, you'll 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 negotiate for me. You'll shut up and go away. And people that are not intellectuals cannot handle any opposing view. And I personally put that on myself. It's like, I'm not going to wait till Reagan says, well, I disagree. I think the opposite. Well, I should have already thought of the opposite before I told you where, what I was thinking. Yes. They, you know? So, um, so it's very emotional at times. And, and, and when it's emotional, it becomes more challenging and, and, and um, probably half the country uh, does not want to hear any evidence of any opposing view of anything they they hold. Uh, Reagan, do you ever hear when I'm talking to uh, the per, uh, PDA workshop and I'll give a, a point and then I'll argue out loud the counterpoint as though I know some of you are thinking this and therefore I know your counterpoint's probably this and I'd like to just explain that this is, it's what's funny is I always feel bad for thinking that way because I'm always like making excuses if that's the way you look at it, but you could think of it like I'm giving an argument a, and then I'm saying, well, you might be thinking that not a is, is also true. 
And that can be true in these circumstances. And I explain it away as though, you know, like what I'm, I'm but it's funny because he's saying, well, that's actually not a bad thing is to be able to, you know, to, uh, to submit the, the counter argument and then say, therefore, um, yeah, no, it's, it, no, it's, it's, it, I think, I think, well, it, listen, <clears throat> I was never an, an athlete. I did dance. That's like as athletic as I got. I did basketball for a hot second. What I really loved was debate. And I think what both of you are talking about now, especially with regards to being open and curious and intellectual and a true scientist, because that's really, if you take the politics out of it and the supposed conclusions that you, that, that we want to hear, it's, you're being very bright about it. It's debate 101. You must come handling the objection. No, Maybe that's my problem is I, I never did debate, but it's, it's exactly what I'm trying to do. But, and then I do it out loud. And then I wonder if sometimes people are thinking, why don't you just present the argument rather than the counter argument? I'm like, I don't know. This is just what I'm th- like, what I'm thinking if I were sitting out in the audience, why I would disagree with what I'm saying. And I'm trying to even counteract that. So say, Howard, you have an MBA, don't you? Yes. Can you tell me, you know, what are your thoughts on some of the online programs these days? Like, and should a dentist consider getting an MBA or did you think out after the fact that you're the craziest duck in the world for, uh, for even doing an MBA on top of your DDS degree? What was your thoughts with that? Well, I'm going to go back. You're in Iowa. Um, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. I went to Creighton in Omaha, Nebraska. Yeah, that's right. Warren Buffett. Um, the Oracle of Omaha, back when I was a little kid, I was you know, 18 years old, a freshman, and he came over and talked to our class. And by the way, I loved Iowa because uh, in Nebraska, you had to be 21 to drink, so we had to cross over. <laughs> drive over to Council Bluffs, huh? <laughs> drive over to Council Bluffs. And, I, felt, and I, I feel like I connected with a zebra because when the bars closed at one, you had to go to this bridge, and there were two cop cars parked on each side, and all you little zebras were going through the creek <laughs> knowing – those alligators were going to get and kill someone and you just were like hoping it wasn't you, but, but you know, you're, you're making it sound like Tiger King was shot in council bluffs, buddy. <laughs> and you know, very well, that could have been the case, <laughs> but you know, what's really interesting about Warren Buffett and we have to say Charlie Munger because Warren gets all the, um, all the press and Charlie Munger is, is thinking equal is that sure. um, um, they never wanted to go to wall street and they never wanted to live in New York because they didn't want to hear all the noise. They wanted to be alone with their thoughts. Mm-hmm. And that's what, um, and that, that's what you'll see with introverts. I mean, introverts, um, you know, they're alone with their thoughts. You have to think. And, and a lot of times with social media and all this, people are just bouncing from one viewpoint and they're bouncing around like a ping pong ball. A lot of stimulus. And Charlie Munger always talks about that the only reason he's a billionaire is because he can take a deeply held personal belief and with new information start to slowly dismember this long held belief. And then the next thing he realizes is this company is very undervalued and is very valuable deal. And while everybody says it's not worth any money, Charlie and Warren realized, no, this is indeed, in fact, a lot of money. And so, you know, to be able to entertain a thought and then reject it is just not human. I mean, humans are, you know, you're told something, so you believe it. Sure. And then you believe it your whole life. I mean, like, like, like my, oldest, my oldest sister is a 60-year-old now. I'm 57. She's, I think my sisters are 58 and are 60 and 60-something. Um, do you think you, the PDA could have a one-day seminar, and when the end, they would leave and be Lutherans? <laughs> if so, let, let alone, that's, let alone that's, that's Hindus that's, or Muslims or I mean, I mean, it, sure. it, so, so people th- their their long-held beliefs are just not open. Um, I mean, your dentistry. When you say to them, you say, "Okay, when girls go out to get their hair done." I mean, I mean, Reagan, uh, I'm a bald man. I, I have to ask you, is that when, when you go out and get your hair done, when you, when you get the big perm and the big dippity do, what, what does that cost? Uh, oh, yeah, to color my hair, which I'm not doing anymore, $225 every six weeks if I am keeping Stay up. Stay on top of it. Yeah. Yep. Um, but, um, An incredible uh, amount of money. So, not you know, <laughs> department. In a hygiene department, you know, the American market is 330 million people, and everybody that does statistics knows in dentistry it's two markets. Half the people, it's a commodity. 
they just want to buy on price, that their insurance says go here and the clean exam and x-ray is free. Well, that's obviously where they're going. I mean, if you gave them a card and said you get free gasoline over here. So what is a commodity? A commodity is something that just trades on price. Um, so when I buy a gallon of gas, I don't care if it's from Iran or Alaska or Texas. It's just a gallon of gas. Um, it trades on price. The other half of dentistry is value added. I'm afraid of the dentist. I, you got to touch me. I, what's it going to look like? All these things like that. And so back to your question about the MBA, I, I signed up for an MBA and I bought my first laptop. It was 1998. And I took my laptop and, and it was on uh, two classes. It was three trimesters a year for two years. So it was two classes, two classes, two classes. That was six classes, one year, t- uh, 12 total. And I just sat there, opened up a Word document, and I was only going to take notes about what applied to dentistry. I mean, I, I didn't care about the review of algebra and cosine sure. and tangents and sure. calculus, and I, I didn't need to go on a date with Sir Isaac Newton again. I wanted to know how is this going to affect my practice. And sure. I took vicious notes for two years, and when I was done, I um, turned those two notes into my 30-day dental MBA – uh, which I put on uh, YouTube, uh, it's on iTunes, and when they're home right now, um, right now, they, they have the gift of time. I mean, mm-hmm. everybody's so mad that they don't go to work. I'm sorry, I thought you hated work and we're looking forward to Friday to enjoy the weekend, and now you're pissed off that you have this big gift of time. It's I'm almost sorry. like their perspective is jacked up either way. Yeah, I mean, I woke Ouch. up today, and I didn't know if it was Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday. I just knew it was Chad and Reagan Day. I knew I was going to talk. <laughs> I love it. So happy Chad Tuesday, Reagan Wednesday the 3rd. And and so the bottom line, they got this gift of time. I mean, that 30-day MBA, that's 30 hours. It took me two years of school, <clears throat> which I recommend to anyone. I mean, I'll tell you this. This is kind of an embarrassing story, but... You know, my thoughts when I was in dental school the first year, I kept having this reoccurring thought because I I know for hip, I can't say this, but let's just say this. My mom or dad or someone in my uncles and grandmas and, you know, like one side has no teeth. They all have dentures. They all had, they had dentures before they got out of high school. That's not HIPAA. That's a Thanksgiving at your house, right? Yeah. (laughs) And I was sitting in dental school the whole time thinking if I wouldn't have decided I was on the path to lose all my teeth. I, mm. I was just like my uncles and blah, 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 blah. And it's the same thing. Every lawyer I know, about half of the lawyers I know don't practice law anymore. They took their law degree and now they're, you know, some executive Doing vice something. president in some company or they own their own business. But they all say, I'm so glad I'm a lawyer because I'll never think the same way again. I'm so glad I went to undergrad um, because – you know, the only four sciences are, you know, math is the, is the language and it starts with physics and then uh, applied physics is chemistry and applied chemistry is biology and applied biology is dentistry and medicine. So if you don't know math, physics, chemistry, biology, you, you don't know anything. I mean, those, those are the four pillars of, of science for the last 5,000 years. And, and when you go to MBA school, you get a, a strong sense of business and you'll never think the same way again once you learn a few basic uh, concepts. So I would recommend that uh, you go to YouTube and um, or iTunes, and it's 30 hours, bud. Just knock it out. And I can. And what's also what I'm really interested in is I came out with that in '98, and now it's 2000, 2020. And people say, "Well, is it still relevant?" And I say, "No. That geometry and algebra and business those." Those concepts die. In fact, we're getting rid of addition, subtraction, multiplication, division. These are all things that just had a phase and they're, they're gone now. But the, 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 the business of uh, dentistry, it's not going to change until we have some material evolutionary advancement or something. So people are going to be, I mean, you look at the 5,000 years of recorded history, the human is the same. That's where the saying um, you know, um, the more things change, the more they, they stay the same. Because the more things change from the telegraph to the telephone to the internet, well, that's the numerators. The common denominator is still you, a homo sapien. Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're not changing. You're the common denominator in this entire um, uh, movie, you know? Right. This Do is going to be 
going to be really interesting when it comes to our children. I don't, I know, I think your children are grown, Howard. I don't know if you have grandchildren yet, but, but my kids are there and, and Chad's kids, they're both out of school right now because the schools are closed. And when I was in high school, I uh, participated in a, an experiment that the school was running. So it was three, three classes looped together. It was technology, history, and English, and they grouped them all together. And it was open curriculum. Like you, you generated your own curriculum and then they acted as advisors to you, the teachers. And it got me thinking on my own. It actually paved the way for the career that I have because I didn't have someone telling me what to do. I had to take ownership in it. Isn't that interesting? Think of math and biology and chemistry. Um, we're keeping our kids' schedules loose, but giving them tools. And Khan Academy is one. And my son, who's a kindergartner, I had no idea how, how much he would take to the mathematics of it, how addicted he would become to it. And he is flying through it. And he's not even six yet. It's almost Montessori-esque, you know, like just choose Maybe your own so. adventure. Yes. Rylan was in Montessori. She did Montessori yeah. up until kindergarten. So she was younger into it. And it was, it was very open. You do what interests you. And, and Jeff Bezos was Montessori yeah. school too. But, um, um, and Je- Jeff Bezos went to Montessori school and he's the richest. Interesting. And it's, um, but, but the, the thing, the thing that's, that's the most sad is, um, you know, our common language the, the uh, is, is English. And because, um, you know, before World War II, the, the, the language was, uh, for science was German. And, yeah. but as, um, uh, World War II, um, we didn't have to learn German. And, uh, so the science is the international language. Uh, is English and um, the international um, language of math is, is of science is mathematics. And when you um, um, start with math, it's so sad where uh, I, I saw it all through college when people come to you for a math problem, um, they've always thought they were bad in math and they just had really bad math teachers because you would be sitting down talking to them and it, it was like they missed so many pieces of this puzzle and oh my gosh! Me a question about that, and then they would feel bad, and so it's been a journey trying to convince people that you know we all have the same smartphone, but we all have the same brain. I mean, there's nobody in science like, hey, uh, Chad, see that ant hill over there? Well, that ant on the left side, he's a genius. And that other ant over there, he's just a common, stupid guy, and he's not very good in math. So there's no evidence that between ants and crickets and locusts and mice and chimpanzees and dolphins, that there's any um, variance in the brain. The only variance is, is the framework that you're born into, what you're interested in. Like, like, take Galileo. Everybody gives Galileo all these praises of everything he did, and they, they never mention the fact that, well, he, um, his name was Galileo Galileo because that means he was an orphan. I mean, he was a, he was a child. He was a parentless kid living on the streets, but he lived in a town that had- He's just a poor towns. boy and nobody loves him. He lived in a town with 4,000 glass artesians that, where he could make his little lenses for his telescopes. If he'd have been born anywhere else on earth, he wouldn't have had an industry. So, so he was, that's luck. He was born- in Italy when thousands of professional artisans were making glass for centuries. Yes. But other people might not think he's very lucky because he was an orphan on the street. He didn't have any parents. He was childless. So with a child, a lot of it's going to be luck. I mean, Bill Gates talks about that, that he went to a private school and some big company donated some old mainframe computer that they weren't going to use anymore. And he play on it like playground equipment and he took to it. So with kids, so the variance you see in people's aptitudes isn't because of some hard wiring thing they were born with. It's just the luck of where they were born and what they're interested in. And then it's our job to make sure that they just get the basic tools because my, there's nothing that's going to help you more than basic math tools, basic physics, basic chemistry, basic biology. That way, when something new comes out, like a pandemic, you've, spent your whole life with these tools that you've applied to other things and you can start making sense of um, your environment. Right. So here's the, here's one question that I have for you that I want to um, wrap up with. And then I want to go into session two because you need a session two, but let me just stop real quick and ask, and it's a silly question, but we need to know Regan go for it. All right. We need your gut response. Howard, are you ready? Yes. Bacon or eggs? Bacon. 
Hey. Everything's better with bacon. You like a salad, add bacon. You don't like a sandwich, just add bacon. You can add bacon to anything, and it's better. And by Including the way, bacon. something about bacon. You see a lot of um, um, tribalism. So all animals have tribes, and if a male lion dies, sometimes the female will try to walk clear across the park and join another uh, group of lions, and they'll kill her. And and then when humans do that, we're just like evil, and we you know we're, we're it's so strange. It's very, you know all these animals are tribal, and you start seeing a lot of tribalism that the Chinese were eating bats and all that kind of stuff. Well, let me remind you that the Spanish influenza, um, which killed the most of any pandemic, um, was traced all the way back. It was the biggest crime scene in the world. I remember reading the the novel on it. Um, and back in Creighton, and the bottom line is, um, it was all the way traced back to a uh, patient zero because you got to know patient zero who got it first, and it came from a pig to a farmer who was then um, uh, drafted for World War One, went to Leavenworth, which was the first breakout, and then where his troops moved out, followed the breakout, and got it all crazy. So the whole Spanish influenza is because some. Um, Kansas farm boy was eating a pig. Oh, brother. Entry later, it's like, well, some Chinese guy was eating a bat. Well, how about this? I love that you brought that full circle. How about seven coronaviruses that have been infected a human, and um, four of them came from animals, um, or STDs all came from animals. If you have Adam and Eve, and they, how could they give each other an STD? Syphilis and gonorrhea came from cattle and sheep. Um, HIV, the last virus pandemic that killed, you know, tens of millions of people, was traced all the way back from a chimpanzee. Um, you know, um, herpes is found in rabbits. Um, 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 Those herpetic rabbits. And um, koala bears. I mean, all of our STDs was because some human had sex with someone outside our species and a lot of these are diseases because we eat all these other animals. So the bottom line is we live in a biosphere and no one's, everyone was born in the biosphere. No one this instant is not even in the biosphere. You don't have one set, one astronaut in a satellite right now. I mean, we all live in the biosphere and between who we live with, sleep with, eat, farm with, you know, so it's, uh, you know, so it's no, no time for tribalism, but it is, um, it's, well, uh, here's a question. Uh, no, I have two short questions. Number one, could we get you back soon? Absolutely. Good. When, and, you know what, I mean, I'm, I'm sitting here. Someone, someone called me the other day and said, when can I call you? And I said, well, I've got open up 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that's so awesome. the people decide what the hell they're going to do with all their misinformation. I actually thought this would be a good, good time for us to get you on the podcast is when people, you know, are, are down. So I, I wrote Regan and our producer Cashmere and I said, you know, now's the time to get a hold of busy Dennis to get on the podcast. So that's uh-huh. how we got a hold of you. And, and you, know a thanks. Who, you know who got me to come on the show? Yes, a, a big shout out to Dana Salisbury. Dana. Yes, yes. Dana. Dana Golden, Dana. gold girl. Thank you very much for coming on our show today. And I'm so excited about uh, getting you back on that way. I don't hog you as much and maybe Reagan can fit in more than two questions, but I just, I've been really looking forward to having you on today. So thank you. Chad, it was a big honor, but you said something. Can I respond to one thing you said in your clothes? No. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you, you said a deck. You said a deck. And I just want to say that, you know, 20 last year, we lost um, Ken and Joanna Austin, the founders of a deck in, uh, in Oregon, and I, um, um, when I was little, um, the family vacation, dad only wanted to go to all the six flags and theme parks, but he wanted to go to where they make stuff. Yes. So our vacation, we would drive to six flags over Texas, but then we got there. If there was some manufacturing company that made cars or beer or bread and he just loved the stuff. And, and when we, um, so I carried that tradition on my kids. And so whenever we were, like the first time we went to Disneyland, we swung over to 1-800-DENTIST and saw Fred Joyle. And he gave my four boys who have turned into six grandchildren uh, tours. And <clears throat> Jim Glidewell, <clears throat> there's Jim Glidewell, the busiest man in dentistry. I've heard that's the coolest uh, factory uh, tour. Uh, but Jim, Jim gave like a three-hour tour. Yes. To my boys, and they were like, Two, four, six, eight, and their biggest questioner is like, what's that? And <laughs> what's that? Ken, Ken Austin, 
um, you know, um, he was so amazing because at the one end of the factory was raw ingredients of pallets of leather and beads and wire and copper. And at the other end came out of a deck chair. And his hero was, um, was uh, Henry Ford. And he, um, you know, as far as an engineer, and a lot of people nowadays are saying that, oh, Walt Disney, he had these bad thoughts, and Steve Jobs was a bad right. parent, and, and, yep. and yeah, guess what? It. here's a news break. You're not perfect either. You know what I mean? Surprise! <laughs> God forbid we give grace to, uh, to five yeah. generations from now that think that because I called someone Mr. and Mrs., that that was actually rude or, or something along those lines. Within the context of a culture, we need to give grace. And Steve Jobs, well said. And Steve Jobs made the iPhone and his spoiled brat daughter with $5 billion in cash is writing books about what a horrible person he is. Why don't, why don't you give me the $5 billion and I'll be your best damn dad in the world. I mean, the people are crazy, but the bottom wow. line is, you know, don't take away what they did, you know, gifted right because no one else came out with an iPhone. No one else started. I mean, I think there's only 86 people on the earth that ever started an auto company. So when Elon Musk is smoking pot on the Joe Rogan show, give him some space. He started a car company and a rocket company. And I'm sure you're going to find some wrong with the hell he married and divorced the same woman twice. You know, he probably has a few issues. Right. But when you start a car company, Tesla, and a rocket reusable company, it's time to just shut up, get out of his way, and help harvest all those. Or how about you become his colleague, then you can criticize him. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. And that, that's a critic. That's a critic. They have, they have no resume. I mean, it's, it's so easy to sit on the bank of a river and look at a bridge and tell you yeah. everything that's wrong with the bridge. Yep. I'm like, well, where's your bridge? Oh, I, I've never made a bridge. I just hypothetically, right, exactly. hypothetically, I could, I could paint that picture. You know, like anyone could paint that picture, and it's just, yeah, sure. Well, then do and, it. And then the other problem you always have is the violence. Like people get mad because the bridge isn't like they want it, so then they blow up the bridge. I'm like, well, anybody can blow up a bridge. Right. Anybody can critique a bridge. Be destructive. This person made a bridge. Yeah, it, uh, eternal called- skepticism is for lazy people. Yeah, for sure. And, and, and I don't know why um, a a lot of people always say when they start doing podcasts or they start speaking in dentistry or they start doing anything, um, somebody says something and they get all offended and hurt and they're, you know, they're just wounded. And I'm like, why are you giving this person credit? I mean, you know, yourself, you know, your friends and family, you know what you're doing. And, and 92% of all the humans are dead anyway. And of the eight, almost eight billion that are alive, you're not going to ever know seven and a half billion of them. So you're already basically alone with your thoughts. Just, just, just be good. Work hard, and don't worry about critics and somebody sitting on the the um, the banks of a river telling you what's wrong with your bridge when they wouldn't even know how to begin building a bridge. And that's what we need to do. We need to build a bridge across coronavirus. And it was an honor to be on your show. I'll be back anytime you want, Chad. Let's make it soon because I, th- I, you know, I, you know, because I sent it to you. I've got more questions. It's just how in the world do we fit it in with you? So thank you so much for coming on our show. Let's uh, let's take a hard break, and we're looking forward to the next episode. If you're listening to this, search again for Howard Fran because he's popping up again. Thanks, guys. Bring your lunch or take us to the gym again next week to improve your everyday practices. Also, subscribe on iTunes, follow us on social media, and sign up for our email list. Now get out there and win with everyday practices.